1993's Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2, directed by Takao Okawara. At this point in time, Toho had some momentum with their monster star Godzilla. As previously mentioned, toys were a big source of revenue, but as the 90s began, video games could be added to the merchandise vault. I haven't talked much about Godzilla video games so far, but considering the 90s was the decade of Nintendo and Sega, and the decade that I grew up in, let's explore that for a bit. 1993 would be the year that Super Godzilla would come out for the Super Famicom in Japan, or as it's known in the US, the Super Nintendo. However, this wasn't the first Godzilla video game. As far as I can tell, the first Godzilla video game was made in 1984, titled Godzilla vs. Three Giant Monsters for MSX. Obviously, the games would get better over time. Most of the good ones back then were Japan only, but once PS2 and GameCube came out, I was finally able to play some kick-ass Godzilla games. Nowadays, I enjoy Godzilla for PS4, and I loved playing City Shrouded in Shadow. This movement on the joystick makes this fucking bike go crazy. Yeah! So with the Heisei era producing a string of financially successful Godzilla films, the King of Monsters was once again drawing attention from Hollywood. This wasn't so surprising considering there were some Hollywood bigwigs who liked Godzilla. As I've mentioned before, Martin Scorsese was a fan of Ishiro Honda, and he made sure to let Honda know that he spent his youth watching Godzilla films and wanted to buy fresh prints from Toho. Tim Burton wanted to be the guy in the Godzilla suit, and Steven Spielberg would include the monster multiple times in his TV show Animaniacs, along with Rodan. Spielberg would be influenced by Godzilla when creating the classic film Jaws, and in 1993 he would release what would become another classic. Welcome to Jurassic Park. In the 90s, Jurassic Park would boost interest in anything dinosaur-related, and as a small child growing up in this time, I can attest, dinosaurs were number one, especially the T-Rex. This dinosaur hype would increase interest and rentals of old Godzilla movies. If the T-Rex was awesome, Godzilla was even a step above that. As a kid, I would often go to the mall with my dad, and specifically, Suncoast. While he looked for whatever latest movie was out, I would go off on my own to this same shelf that would always have random old Showa-era and sometimes Heisei-era Godzilla films. At the time, I had no idea if they were old or not, I just thought they were fucking awesome. In 1992, Henry Saperstein brokered a deal between Toho and Tristar to make an American Godzilla movie. Tristar promised they wouldn't use Suitmation and would instead give Godzilla the full Hollywood treatment with computer animation. But two years would pass with no ground being broken. The two men who wrote the Disney movie Aladdin were brought in to write the story. Terry Razio and Ted Elliott would complete writing their story in 1994. It's safe to say that some people would get ahead of themselves. The first American production. Dynamic Hollywood filmmaking. Groundbreaking visual effects. All new American version Godzilla. In their story, Godzilla is not created from nuclear fallout, but rather he's a dinosaur who's encased in fluid and eventually wakes up and starts to wreak havoc. At the same time, in Utah, a meteorite lands and an alien monster emerges and fuses with a colony of bats to become a giant bat monster. As the story goes along, the bat monster absorbs more creatures and eventually becomes the griffin. I won't get into the details, but I will say that some of the elements that give the Godzilla character real-world meaning were removed from this story. A lot of names were attached to this project, like Tim Burton, but it would be director Jan de Bont who would initially get the job. He was welcomed with open kaiju arms when he flew to Japan to meet with Toho, but TriStar Studio and de Bont could not agree on a budget. TriStar estimated that Razio and Elliott's script would cost an unacceptable $140 to $180 million. Conflicting visions and other disagreements would cause him to leave the position in September of 1994, throwing the whole thing into development hell. By the spring of 1995, Tristar would say they were no longer involved with Godzilla. Razio and Elliot's story would be made into a graphic novel in 2015 by illustrators Todd Tennant and Eldrin Ardiente. The graphic novel and original screenplay are both available online if you ever want to check them out. Terry Razio would go on in later years to be the head of the writer's room for 2021's Godzilla vs. Kong. But anyway, back in 1993, the rumors about this American film would help fuel another rumor, that this next Japanese Godzilla movie would be the last. Adding to the speculation, Toho would purposely leak fake spoilers that Godzilla was going to die, which, to be honest, was a pretty clever marketing technique. 
Before Mechagodzilla was the decided upon enemy for the movie, an early draft submitted by designer Yutaka Izabuchi had Godzilla fighting a metallic alien monster named Berserk. Berserk would grow bigger throughout the story, until finally looking like a more conventional Mechagodzilla design. Another draft saw a Mechagodzilla that was split into several different parts, and would eventually come together to form Mechagodzilla Union. The fucking union that works for you! Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 would begin production in the fall of 1993, and Toho had an aggressive marketing campaign. There were commercials, and just like for Godzilla vs. Mothra, a promotional TV show was aired. Every Thursday morning, Adventure Godzilland would air, and they would promote merchandise along with there being some silly skits. <laughs> Director Okawara wanted the theme of this movie to be natural life versus artificial life, representing the artificial life corner, Mechagodzilla. The beginning of this movie establishes that the UN has created a special task force geared towards stopping Godzilla. Its military wing is deemed G-Force. One of G-Force's projects is to build a mechanical counter to the King of Monsters. In this movie, Mechagodzilla is built from the remnants of Mecha King Ghidorah. Just like its Showa-era predecessor, it has a shit ton of abilities. Just to list a few, we have the Mega Buster, which is the equivalent of Godzilla's atomic breath. It also has laser eyes, and much like Mecha King Ghidorah, has a shock anchor that latches onto Godzilla and has electricity run through it. Mecha Godzilla is also protected by diamond coating, which is the same in-universe technology from Godzilla vs. Biollante's Super X2. Instead of instantly reflecting Godzilla's attack, Mecha Godzilla can absorb the atomic breath and fire it back as a plasma grenade. At the end of the film, Mechagodzilla combines with the Garuda weapon, and then becomes Super Mechagodzilla. Katsuchi Murakami of Bandai would help create the design for this new Mechagodzilla. Wataru Fukuda, who played the godzilla Saurus in Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, was back to play the Mecha Kaiju. Shinichi Wakaza supervised the modeling of the Mechagodzilla suit. It was constructed from very thin, fiber-reinforced plastic, resulting in it being light despite its heavy, armored appearance. Because the suit was delicate in nature, the movie mostly has it attack from afar, not engaging in short-range combat until the end. Shinichi Wakaza is the founder of Monsters, Inc., a special effects company that would have its hand in Godzilla movies until 2004's Godzilla Final Wars. Megumi Otaka's Mickey character gets a much more substantial role, with the military deciding it might be smart to utilize her psychic link with Godzilla. Mickey's link is focused on more, and we see her character starting to feel some sentimentality towards the monster. But I think an opportunity was missed here. I'll get to that in a minute. Toho was insisting that they bring back Manila, or Minya, and mostly everyone was for it, except the director. Okawara would have none of it, and he asked for a new character to be created instead. So we get Baby Godzilla. This time they do a much better job showing a young Godzilla, or in this case, godzilla -saurus. The egg hatching scene is much less disturbing, that's for sure. Shinji Nishikawa and his team designed Baby Godzilla with Harakin Ryu donning the suit. A miniature model and animatronics would be used in some parts as well. I think they did a good job having the baby kaiju show emotion. Ryu was a big help for Toho, as he didn't just play baby Godzilla, King Ghidorah, and Batra, he also helped with storyboards and design drafts. At this time, women still made up the majority of moviegoers in Japan, so the incentive was there to make the little monster cute. Baby Godzilla is found on Adano Island in what's believed to be a Pteranodon egg guarded over by the irradiated Pteranodon Rodan, who saw baby Godzilla as his younger brother. In the movie, it's proposed that a Godzilla-saurus laid its egg in the Pteranodon's nest, so that the Pteranodon would raise and care for the hatchling instead. This is similar to what the common cuckoo bird does, laying its eggs in other birds' nests. Baby Godzilla is not like the Godzilla we all know. Baby, as it's affectionately called, is friendly towards humans and doesn't have the temper of the older Godzilla. A researcher named Azusa happens to be there when the egg hatches. Baby immediately sees the researcher as its mother. Azusa is played by Ryoku Sano, and let me say, she does an excellent job in her only Godzilla film, and I'm not taking anything away from her. 
But as I alluded to earlier about a missed opportunity, it would have made more sense to me anyway if Mickey would be the one with the connection to Baby Godzilla rather than the new character. And this would give Otika a more prominent role as her character has been sort of pointless the last few movies. If you're going to have a recurring character, you might as well give her more opportunities to showcase herself. Either way, this isn't a criticism. Sano does an amazing job, so it's not a big deal. The Heisei era would resurrect another Showa era favorite, Rodan. Rodan keeps its abilities from the previous era, but with a pretty cool transformation added in called Fire Rodan. When in this form, Rodan can fire a uranium heat beam much like Godzilla's atomic breath. In past films, Rodan had a suit actor, but Heisei era Rodan would be a series of props. Rodan was modeled under Wakasa and his employees of Monster Inc. At least four props were used to portray the monster, including a full-scale main model, half-size model, a bust for close-up shots, and models of its legs. The full body and close-up models had a radio-controlled mouth, neck, and eyes. Kawakita himself would operate a hand puppet in some scenes. In one of the earlier drafts, there would be a male and female Rodan as a nice homage to the original Rodan movie that had two. Plus an opening scene set in the Cretaceous period showing a battle between a Godzilla-saurus and a Pteranodon. Another thing from earlier drafts is that Fire Rodan was named White Rodan. The fights involving Rodan and Godzilla harken back to the Showa era a bit with a lot of close-range combat. It's as if Kawakita heard the criticisms of his reliance on beam battles. But don't worry, if you like projectile fighting, there's a lot of that too. Godzilla is a bit stockier, with some saying this was done to give the monster a more maternal look, though I couldn't find any reliable sources to back that up. Kenpachiro Satsuma plays Godzilla again and uses subtle movements to show Godzilla's anger and desperation as it looks for baby Godzilla. The script for the film was written by series newcomer Wachiru Mimura. Mimura was a fan of the early Showa era movies and said it was a lifelong dream to write for a Godzilla movie. He was heavily influenced by Toho legend Shinichi Sekizawa. Speaking of Sekizawa, he would pass away a year prior to this film's release on November 19, 1992 at the age of 72. The man who wrote the vast majority of Godzilla and other Showa-era Toho movies will have, through those movies, his whimsical and joyful nature live on. Mr. Sekizawa was childish, but in a good sense. With Sekizawa and Honda both passing away within months of each other and Tanaka not in the best shape, perhaps it was starting to set in just how long this Godzilla franchise had been around, and how fitting it would be if this was the last film. What's different in this film than prior Heisei era movies is that Godzilla isn't portrayed as the obvious bad guy here, but more of a concerned parent trying to protect its young. It's not really a fight between the bad guys and good guys. Both sides are fighting for good. The theme was written so that the viewer will empathize with the creatures. Kawakita's special effects team did a good job as usual, though I was a little disappointed with how Rodan looked and moved. Because Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 was originally planned to be the final entry in the Heisei series, Okawara wanted to pay tribute to some past movies. And of course, the beam struggle towards the end is an homage to the original Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. There's a few inside jokes sprinkled in as well. There's a small part where Cosmos actresses Sayaka Asawa and Kieko Imamura from Godzilla vs. Mothra play staffers at the ESP Institute. And in a wink to the audience, they speak in unison, just like when they played the Cosmos. Another inside joke occurs when Aoki visits Hosono, who says he doesn't trust him one bit. The joke being that Hosono is portrayed by Tadao Takashima, the father of Masahiro Takashima, who plays Aoki. We all remember Tadao Takashima from his Showa era days, appearing in numerous Godzilla movies. And both his sons would become actors too. Masanobu Takashima would play Shokuroki in Godzilla vs. Biollante, and Masahiro here would be in this movie and go on to play Kuroki also, his brother's former role, in 1995's Godzilla vs. Destroya. Masahiro showcases his father's natural charisma and comes off as very likable in this one. Even in his advanced age, Akira Ifakube was still at the top of his game, creating themes for each monster. Additionally, the ancient plant song is simultaneously haunting and beautiful. Oh. 
Even the dead Mecha King Ghidorah corpse in the beginning of the movie gets a theme. Though the strong, robust Mecha Godzilla theme is probably my favorite. The biggest improvement they made when compared to previous movies is the variety of battles. We get Mecha Godzilla vs. Rodan, Godzilla vs. Rodan, Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla, throw in Fire Rodan, Garuda, and Super Mecha Godzilla as well. The fights are pretty graphic at times too. When Godzilla fights Super Mecha Godzilla, they show the G Crusher weapon ripped through the skin in a gruesome manner. During the climax of the final battle, the relationships between the different monsters are leveraged nicely. Baby Godzilla even helps his dad out by getting his nest mate Rodan to come to his aid. We also see Mickey's relationship with Godzilla hit a crucial point. Despite her being a part of an operation that's goal is to kill the monster, she begins to feel bad for the creature that she shares a psychic link with. Why feel bad for a monster that has killed and destroyed so much? Even with Okawara saying that Godzilla is not the bad guy in this movie, that it's just a parent looking for its child, we have to take into account prior movies where he kills a lot of innocent people. We often don't see the victims of Godzilla's attacks, so a lot of the times we just associate the monster with destroying buildings and fighting other monsters. In a way, Mickey represents the audience, having questionable sentimentality towards a creature that has killed many. It's a pivotal moment for her character and the most memorable so far. At no point was I rooting for Mecha Godzilla. I, and I'm sure a lot of other fans, wanted Godzilla to kick its ass. And eventually, we do get that. The final battle has some nice symmetry to it, as Rodan's sacrifice not only heals Godzilla, but powers him up. In the same way that Garuda powered up Mechagodzilla. And in this battle of artificial life versus natural life, nature wins. Godzilla emits so much radiation that Super Mecha Godzilla's diamond coating starts to melt. We've never seen this before. Kawakita really got creative with the monster action. With its spines turning red, Godzilla finishes off Super Mecha Godzilla with a red atomic breath surrounded by golden spirals. This is easily the most powerful form of Godzilla we've seen up to this point. Godzilla is victorious again, and humorously, Mechagodzilla's internal computer says that the whole crew is dead, despite the opposite being the case. Azusa tearfully says goodbye to baby Godzilla, as it was now time for the young one to begin living with his own kind. And it is Mickey who uses her abilities to convince the baby to go with Godzilla, which ends up being the push he needs. The movie ends with the cast watching Godzilla and his son leave. They originally wanted the young kaiju to sit in Godzilla's mouth as they got in the water, but that would have been a pain in the ass to film, so instead he just swims alongside with his much larger dad. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 would release in Japanese theaters on December 11th, 1993, and would go on to sell roughly 3,800,000 tickets. Not the 4,200,000 tickets sold for the previous movie, but a nice outing nonetheless. In the US, the movie would go directly to VHS in 1999. They would toy around with a few different endings. One ending had Godzilla being killed by Mechagodzilla, but the Garuda weapon's destruction would somehow resurrect him. Another ending would have Godzilla die, but then baby Godzilla would absorb the radiation and grow to true Godzilla size. Okawara really wanted to kill Godzilla, partly because of how powerful a statement it is. To Okawara, part of what made the original Godzilla so memorable is that they kill the monster at the end. But Toho wasn't going to let him do that, as it became more obvious towards the end of the production that this wasn't going to be the last movie. So there was no reason to kill the Golden Goose. Not yet, anyway. I enjoyed this film from beginning to end, and I think the ratio of human scenes to monster scenes is perfect. That's probably no coincidence, considering this movie sets the record for Godzilla screen time. But for a Godzilla movie, the human characters are written well, and they don't try to do too much with subplots like Kazuki Omori tended to do, a la Godzilla vs. Biollante. This movie knew exactly what it wanted to do and executed the relationships between the humans and monsters perfectly. Now onto a movie that I think a good portion of Godzilla fans consider the low point of the Heisei era. Next up is 1994's Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. 